Well, hi, I'm back with some more um, to say about Psalm 139. And I it's my second favorite Psalm. I thought maybe I would finish it up today, but as I'm looking at it, I'm seeing more and more things that I'm really liking to talk about. So I'm gonna take some time with it, maybe, maybe this session and one more before I finish it up. The section that we talked about last time was all about God knowing everything about me and the intimacy that God wants from each of us. And we read it from the New Living Translation, and it sounded like this. Oh, Lord, you have examined my heart, and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and you when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say, even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I love that. God is so awesome. We could impossibly understand. You know, we, we, we can sort of understand, but not really, not completely. I'm getting out my other Bible, my NIV Bible, New International Version Bible, only because I want to say that this last section that I just read, I love the way they say it. Uh, they say, and this is verse six, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. I love it, lofty. It's way up there, people, way up in the stratosphere. We couldn't even begin to understand it if we wanted to, you know? We can just, uh, I think it's one of those things we just need to accept about God and praise him for because it's it's too lofty, too too up there for us to get it, you know? The NIV goes on with some questions, and I think it's it's confusing at first when you hear these questions because you think, why is he asking this? It's obvious he loves the Lord, and he he's asking these questions about getting away from the Lord. The psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? I do not think the psalmist is actually saying he wants to run away from God. I don't think that's the point at all. The point is almost that this is a question that is rhetorical. You know, it's it's saying this is this question is so obvious that there's only one obvious answer. Where can I flee? Nowhere. You know, God is spirit. Spirit is everywhere. So the uh, the New Living Translation that we've been reading from doesn't translate it as a question. It translates it actually as a statement, and it says. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. Again, this is not saying you're hounding me, you're there. You know, it, it's more of a reassuring thing that no matter where I go, God is always there. There's no way to get away from him in the sense of, of being in a place where he's not. Okay? So then the psalmist goes on to mention different um, uh let's say opposites or extremes that, that kind of demonstrate that there's nowhere you could possibly get that God isn't. So he says, if I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. Other translations translate that word grave as sheol, S-H-E-O-L. And you might have seen that word that Hebrew sheol word means the place of the dead. That's why here they translate it grave. Could also maybe be translated hell, you know? It's the place of dead, okay? So if you go down to the, if I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, and if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there, your hand will guide me, and your strength will support me. So he is using all kinds of extremes, the highest high, the lowest low, the furthest ocean, the, you know, the, the biggest distance, the farthest um, place, no matter where God is there. So this is, is, again, not to say that we want to get away from God, but more a reassurance that no matter where we are, we can depend on God to be there. And then also God is omnipresent and omniscient, okay? Omnipresent, present everywhere, always present. 
omniscient knows everything. So these, again, are, not only are they words that are difficult to understand, they are concepts that we as humans can almost not even dream of. We're thinking like infinity, you know? It's this hard concept to think of. But he's saying, I'm using all these extremes so that human beings can get a, at least get a little grasp on it. The farthest ocean, the highest high, the lowest low. No matter where I go, God, you are spirit and you will be with me. This is, again, very reassuring. And even there, your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. So he's saying, you know, your, your spirit, you're going to be there and you're not going to change. You're just always going to be there no matter where I am. Okay, now he gets to talk about darkness and light. And now he's getting into a little bit more about um, the ways that we might try to hide from God. Okay, and we go right back to the Garden of Eden. You know, the first thing Eve and Adam did when they knew they had sinned was cover up their bodies. They wanted to wear leaves. They wanted to hide in the bushes. Okay. And, and it's so ridiculous that you can't hide from God. You know, we knew that. You can't hide from God, but we still try to do it, don't we? We still try to do it. We don't um, admit something that we've done wrong, even to ourselves sometimes, let alone another person or, or God himself. I have found even in my prayers, sometimes I rationalize or justify something. You don't have to do that with God. You can be honest about what's happened. And you can just be, hey, I blew it, you know? Give me strength for the future because I know, <laughs> you know, I can't do it without you, you know. We don't have to hide things from God, but yet we try to. And the world, people who are not believers really try to do this. They they justify and rationalize and, and the Bible says they look for darkness because they think it's going to hide them. So this is what he's talking about now in verse 13, 11. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. Darkness means nothing to God. He created the light in the dark. You know, did you ever notice most crimes, uh, you know, happen at night? People feel the darkness hides them. You know, they hide in the darkness. And we do it spiritually by hiding in our own darkness, not even admitting to ourselves what's really going on. It's And he says in verse 12, But even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Isn't that great? It doesn't matter whether we're in the dark or the light. We don't have to hide anything because it's all the same to God. He already knows. The thing is, God is always with me. He's always knowing me. He's always loving me. He's always forgiving me. He's always celebrating me. He's always affirming me. Uh, whether I want to go hide or not, you know, he'll wait it out. He'll just wait it out until I'm ready to come back to him. You know? Um, I love how... Someone told me a long, long time ago that our relationship with God is a lot like uh, the newlywed couple that were riding along in the car. And years ago, we didn't have bucket seats. We had a, a bench in the middle, you know. And so when you were first dating the love of your life, you know, you slid over to the middle and, you know, you kind of cuddled. And he, as the driver, put his arm around me, you know, and uh, that kind of thing. It was It was a real loving, close relationship. So... Uh, think about that couple, and years later, the woman is now sitting on the other side of the car, and the man is still driving, and she says, you know, we're just not as close as we used to be, you know? Remember when, years ago, when we used to cuddle and, and be close to one another? And, uh, and he looks at her and says, I haven't moved. <laughs> so, this is what we do to God. We move away. God's still at the steering wheel. We move away. And then we say, God, where are you? You know, you're not close to me. I don't feel close to you. Well, if you don't feel close to God, it's because you've moved, not God. Okay? Because this is the thing that we're saying here. Even in darkness, darkness is as light to him. It doesn't, it doesn't make a difference to him. He's still there. He's always the same. So he's always there. So now we come to verse 
13 to 17, let's say. And this is probably the most precious part of this sum. The part that helped me the most, I know that, with, with self-esteem and confidence. You made all the delicate and inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous how well I know it. You watched me when I was being formed in utter seclusion as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God? They cannot be numbered. When's the last time you realized that God finds you so precious that his thoughts are totally precious about you. That's great. When's the last time you thought about the fact that before you were even born, God knew who you were? He knew you inside and out when you were still in your mother's womb. And not only that, he created you exactly the way he wanted you to be. Yeah, I know, you don't like your thighs, or you don't like your temper, or you don't like your level of intelligence, or you don't, you don't like your laugh. I don't know, what, what you don't like about yourself? Your hair, I don't like my hair. You know, but God said, this is the way this person's going to be, and I love every single part of him or her. Every part. Every part. <laughs> You know, do we celebrate that? Do we say, every part of me is exactly the way God wanted me to be? Sometimes we say, I hate it that I'm so impatient, or I hate it that I'm so um, overly friendly, or I hate it that I'm so shy, I hate it that I'm so fat, or I hate it that I'm so uh, artistic and I don't like to do... Uh, I don't like to do physical things. I'm, I'm all in my head all the time. I hate that about me. I wish I liked tennis, you know. <laughs> Whatever it is about you, you ought to be celebrating the good things about you because that's how God created you and knit you together exactly the way he wanted you inside of your mother's womb before you were even born. When you get a hold of that, how can you have poor self-esteem? <laughs> how can you say, I'm not worthwhile? when you know God made you exactly the way he wanted to make you. And you are exactly the way he wants. Let me look at the other translation of this because I think it's beautifully written in the uh, New International Version. It says, For you created me, my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. What if you said that to God? I praise you, God, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You made me and, and I'm me. And that's so great. I love it, you know? Because you made me, you made me fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. So he's saying, you know, hey, I know you do not create junk. So I know that, so then I've got to be, I've got to be wonderful then. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. God had vast things in mind when he created you. He had all these things in mind for you. All your days, he already knew exactly what was going to happen to you. That doesn't mean he, you know pushed you in certain directions, it means that he understands already what your whole life is going to be like before you're even born. And that's precious. I'm precious to him. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We are God's masterpiece. You know, uh, 
there's a verse in Ephesians that says, you know, we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has prepared in advance that we should do them. We're his masterpiece. Every single one of us is his masterpiece. Every single one of us was created for certain reasons the way we are, you know, and uh, we're not all going to be the same. And that's okay for God because he has different missions and different reasons why he wants each of us to be the way we are. But we can rest in that and we can say, how precious are your thoughts about me, oh God. They cannot be numbered. You have so many wonderful ideas about just about me that I can't even number them. And he has the same number for every single person. How vast how vast, that word vast. I cannot even count them, he says. They outnumber the grains of the sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Every day is a new day, you know? When I wake up, you're still with me. What a great thought. Not only is he before me, behind me, with me, next to me, in me. Every day when I wake up, I can say, thank you, God. Thank you that I woke up today and let me live today exactly the way you ordained, the way you want me to live it, the way you created me to be. And let me be happy in that, you know. There are many things about myself that I don't like, but I have learned to simply accept them and as much as I can, turn them around to use them the way God would want me to use them. So I am a person, for example, that does things quickly. And it's gotten me into trouble many, many times. I wish I wasn't that way. I wish I was slow and methodical and took my time with things and was careful. Okay. I want to be that person. And to a certain extent, I can cultivate that, right? I can ask God to help me and I can work on it and become a little bit more like that. But I'm never going to totally be that slow, methodical person. It's just not me. It's just not me. I was criticized for that many times, many times. You're so fast. Stop doing that so, come on, take your time. You know, I can think of many situations and many examples um, where, I, where that became a criticism of me. I have learned to accept that about myself. I have learned that there are certain times in my life when that God has put to good use. He has said, now is the time we need somebody fast. Get in there, Karen. You know, I don't, sometimes I don't, I mean, I don't notice that at the time, but when I look back on it, you know, I think, hmm, I was the right person to do that. You know, I got in there and got it done, you know, because I'm quick. I may not be always good. I may not be doing the job exactly the way I should, but I'm fast, <laughs> you know. So once you accept that about yourself, you realize that God is going to use that quality, maybe not in every situation. It's not the good quality of every situation. I'll give you a good example because I'm a, a, when I was working, I was doing speech therapy. And I was pretty good at my job, I think, you know, with most of my cases. The one person that I really struggled with was working with someone with stuttering. Because when you work with someone with stuttering, you need to slow down your own speech. You need to talk slower. You need to be more methodical. You need to be relaxed, you know, because, of course, the more quicker you talk and the more anxiousness you create in the therapy session, the more anxiousness and speed you're, you're modeling for the client. That's okay. I don't have to be perfect with every single person, you know. I don't have to be the best at everything. But when I worked with a person like that, I knew and I consciously slowed down. So God can help me to do that when I need to. But he can also create and, and open up situations where my good qualities are needed, you know, and, and useful to him. So we have to be humble in that regard and recognize we have gifts. Other people have gifts. God has gifted all of us because he knows all of us inside and out. So humility helps us recognize that our own gifts, our own failings, and other people's gifts and failings. So we're all on the same par with that. So I ask God to help me with my failings. I ask him to forgive me for my failings. And I ask him to help me capitalize on my strengths. And at that point, then, this psalm has taught me how to 
have proper self-esteem and confidence in myself and to celebrate the fact that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and so are you. So have a day where you are celebrating how fearfully and wonderfully made you are. Bye now.